to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the 68th episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis, the official podcast of KCAS, Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCS is a bioanalytical CRO serving the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries for over 40 years. My name is John Perkins and I've been in the bioanalytical LCMS space for over 28 years. I'm here with my co-host Dominic Guarino. Hi, uh, Dominic Guarino here, uh, our senior scientific advisor with a focus on ligand binding assays and cell and gene therapies. I've been in the industry for close to 29, I don't know, it's almost 30 years now, John. That's why I that's why I actually stumbled because I was thinking, is it twenty nine? Well, we're getting up there, losing track. <laughs> Dom and I are members of the growing scientific advisory team at KCS. Either or both of us are available to answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS's services. Today we're here with a guest, Carrie Villadal, Associate Director of Cell and Gene Therapy at KCS. Hi, glad to be here, Dominic and John. Dom and Carrie are in Kansas, Jeremy, our producer, is in Missouri, and I'm currently in Lyon, France, so we are truly all over the map. We are thrilled to have you listening to the 68th episode of the podcast, which is now available virtually everywhere. Wherever you choose to find and play your podcast, you can now likely find the weekly bioanalysis. We welcome all of you, whether you're joining us for the first time or if you're a regular listener. Today's podcast will be a review of the latest news and resources and then a focus on the topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we've had from you. We're constantly looking for topics and we'd be happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. So again, we're thrilled to have you here and we're looking forward to a fun episode today. To kick us off for podcast number 68, Dom is going to go over today's podcast topic a bit before we jump into news and resources section. Dom. Hey, John, thanks for that. Um, as always, we'll start the podcast with the news and resources. And then today we have our main portion with our uh, special guest, uh, Carrie Vidalal, will be joining us, as John mentioned. Um, we're going to go over Carrie's background a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, how big the cell and gene therapy space is, discuss the types of services that are needed for support bioanalytically, and then touch a little bit on the hot topics around uh, cell and gene therapy, specifically with a focus of the molecular work. And then last but not least, we'll go over a little bit about some of the conferences and presentations we're going to be up specifically in, in this type of uh, uh, area bioanalytically. So with that, John, let's just jump right into the news and resources. Our first topic is this, I, this is a interesting, it, it, it's my take on this what is, is never, never ignore the history because it might actually have benefits for the future if you, if you learn from what's been done in the past. And this is old rejected antibiotic unearthed to fight antibiotic resistance. And um, historically, a number of old antibiotics came from um, they're essentially natural products. Um, this one is talking about streptothricin, which is from a from is a a component of the compound neuroceothricin, which is a natural pro- byproduct of a soil fungus. Um, d- a lot of natural products like these these compounds that have been found to have antibiotic uh, properties exist in various forms, and neuroceothricin neur- is no exception to that. Um, so this was developed as an antibiotic, and in the 40s it was seen as it really had huge potential, and the New York Times talked about it could be used against typhoid fever, dysentery, mm-hmm. infected wounds and burns. America actually picked a drug up for the pipeline. However, once they did further research, they found there was side effects in, in animals where it, it actually intravenous injections of streptothricin damaged, damaged the stomach, liver, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. rat ultimately killing them so yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't want to be moving that forward into to human research but well, back again, in 1944 we didn't right john right we know a lot more now right yeah. go on but the, <laughs> the deal here is it's that the number of natural different isomers or i shoot isomers is that the right word anyway different forms of streptothricin and in looking further at this a lab at the um, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medi- Medical School looked at streptothricin, looked at the forms, and they found that streptothrice- streptothricin F actually shows activity against a number of um, uh, number of bugs. They were looking actually particularly at the um, Nevada yeah, strain yeah. of carbapenem resistant Enterobacteria or CRA, which is a nightmare superbug that is resistant to all antibiotics currently in use. They actually found that streptothricin F is active against that that bug, 
and they tested it in mice and they've shown that um, mice are might it was effective against in, sorry I'm looking at my I've got no. I've double printed this week so it's a little bit more difficult um, <laughs> so don't worry about it, it no because it's a it's a really interesting story here go on so so, this... they, so they found that it was they it, it behaved differently from other other bacteria notably amino amino that I've worked on in the past and really they're they're tough things to bioanalytically um, but it actually it, it works by interrupting an org, uh, the ribosome, which facilitates mm-hmm. protein synthesis by translating RNA into amino acids. Um, so it does this by, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to pass it on to you well. So basically, <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, the misreading of the genetic blueprint, right? So it just kind of uh, perturbs the whole RNA yeah, it, process it, it, and kills the bug, right? This moment, all bacteria is a function that way, John. This one's yeah. no different. It just found a, a certain ribosomal RNA interaction to disrupt. So right? the way this works, it interrupts translation by going into the decoding center. So it's a different mechanism. Yeah, actually. which is a very unique mechanism. I, I, this isn't my area of expertise. Maybe no, even I know a little bit more about it. But I mean, obviously, we've all studied antibiotics and we understand res- the resistance and what happens. And just in general, my 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 two cents from this is just what you were touching on there. So this, this streptorethacin F, and man, this is why I didn't become a medical doctor, John, right? Um, that that antibiotic finds a way that F version of it uh, can, can get into a ribosomal, um, I think of it as like subunit, as you said, sort of decodes, decodes it, and then it just starts misreading the genetic blueprint. So the moment that happens, the bug's going to die, right? That's how... Gosh. Penicillin, so, I think, functions very similarly. So, j- and, just to, just to give a little bit more on the streptothriacins, they actually looked at D as well, which was six times more active than the F, mm. but it was toxic to to yeah. to kidney cells even yeah. at lower doses. <laughs> Streptothriacin, without that without the toxicity, but has the activity, they can go higher doses, and that's where its effectiveness comes from. So, it's actually it's getting away from the toxicity and finding this yeah. potential. It's amazing. I, I think they take computer. yeah. So the, the long term is now they're trying to synthesize it, yeah. which is another step to hopefully then long term get this into the into the clinic and, and ad- advance it as a, as a therapy. Because obviously antibiotic resistance is always a hot topic because, you know, we have either antibiotics that are effective, but we acquire resistance, then become ineffective or they're just not effective at all. So to, because we've got these superbugs that have, have figured out that they, they're not not affected by what we have. So, yes, I just thought it was a good yeah. one to talk on. It's a wonderful story to kick us off, John, right? Two takeaways. One, thank goodness there's stuff coming to market that is going to help us with these resistant bacteria. This is all, you know, this is fantastic. So I think uh, the audience should be comforted by that, right? That That's a big, I think that's really good. And, and two, um, don't don't ignore old research because yeah, there it is. Yeah. There. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I and there's a lesson in there, right? Like if, if these are scientists from 42 and 44, they were sitting there thinking, "Ah, oh, man, I, 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 this is failure or whatever." And here we are, you know, oh, good lord, so 80 years 80 later, years later. later. <laughs> be great. And, and their research, you know, they didn't have mass specs, they didn't understand this stuff, and they were just blindly kind of trying to to cure. I mean, they understood a little bit, right? But the the amount of information we have 80 years later is leading to, you know, some groundbreaking science. So the, that takeaway is don't ever be discouraged by a negative result. Never. You know, that that there any experiment that doesn't work, unless you really just forget to add something, John, politely. <laughs> but every experiment, even when it's like the spurious ones, the, the ones where the hypothesis is just gray are some of the most powerful ones because these guys – they they clearly have probably cured all sorts of anti you know sort of uh, infections, but they knew it was causing these you know acute and uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, cancers, right? They were it seemed like liver and kidney and all these sorts of things that were so and they didn't know how to adjust, right? They were just like, sure. okay, we can't yeah. use these; yeah. these mice are croaking, right? Yeah. That's it. it that we can't. Use. So this is let's move on. A great first topic, way to kick us off, but it was. Yeah, but just for the sake of time, John, but I, this article was really powerful to me. Yeah, it? absolutely. That, that's why it had to be in. Next yeah. one, um, I'll move on. Dual CRISPR therapy for HIV eliminates vi- virus in mice. And now we're really going from the old days to the, the much more modern. Here we are. Um, but obviously, I, I, there's a lot of discussion in, in, in the media, etc., about about um, anti-HIV drugs. We, we see a lot of, you know, 
um, commercials on on the TV about uh, medications that are out there. And they've made a lot of progress in terms of these um, antiretroviral therapies that people are taking, but they're not then none of them are cures. They're all you have to take them on a daily basis to keep the the virus at bay. Because if you stop, then there's that the chance it will it can come back, and then then you have obviously issues down the in the pipe, which is why people are still looking about what we can do. So there's teams from Temple and University and Univ- Temple University and the University of Nebraska had a strategy that start with dosing HIV positive mice with long acting slow effective release or um and with, or late, sorry, let me talk, let me step back again. They start, they have HIV positive mice, they, they dose with long acting, slow effective antiretrovirals um, and, and see how that works. And then a month later, the, one of the, one of the um, collaborators admin, uses CRISPR-Cas9 um, and this was developed at Temple to inactivate the gene for CCR5. Um, they, they, they know that that, drops the levels of CCR5 in a certain time frame because they've done a lot of background work on that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they initiate a second CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and this, the, what, the way it acts is it's to remove the integrated copies of HIV1 from the host g- genome. Um, and they've done this before in a, in a, in a other pro- Then this is talk about f- learning yeah. from your failures because this is from this a project. Is, yeah. They, 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 they published this in 2019 and showed effectiveness up to a point but here they, they're building on those, those yeah. previous findings and um moving on from there and so taking this dual crispr approach um before they, they'd seen that with with a single crispr um the mouse hiv rebounded within two weeks of treatment but this approach they've actually they've seen mm-hmm. that five and nine treated mice in the second round of sorry they found in six of the ten animals in the, in the treatment group, they found no trace of virus. They repeated it, and five of nine did the same same thing again. So I will pass it back to you to to comment more. Yeah, uh, John, this is um, you know just this this I, I, blessed to be in the field to to see this happening. Right, HIV nineteen eighties people have been researching it. Here we are, forty plus years later, and and they're. Um, potentially finding a way to eliminate it using things that are near and dear to me. I, I would have never, uh, we, actually, I shouldn't say never. I, I, we were treating hepatitis C patients with autologous T-cell therapies in the uh, uh, mid-90s. And so this had always been the, uh, you know, kind of, then we didn't really understand the immune system the way we do today. And here we are, like, just uh, uh, coming a, a real long way. Um, one of the authors, or one of the um yeah, one of the uh, people, uh, Gendelman, in this uh, um, report you got here, I almost went to his laboratory, John. <laughs> okay. I interviewed at it and uh, turned it down and took the job at Streck. So I almost went to the University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, to become a, um, to get my exact title, associate professor or something like that, or a fellow or something. But I, I and then I ran a flow cytometry lab for Streck at UNMC and was a, a professor emer- emeritus there as well for like... Um, I don't know, four years or something. So this this is a, a place I know, a center I'm familiar with, and uh, hats off to them. And then uh, this dual approach, um, you know, I, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit, and let's make sure there's no. Um, just seems like a lot of manipulation of the of of one's immune, you know, I'm gonna say immune cells, but more just genetics. <laughs> and so uh, we just gotta see, but you know. Overall, I'm I'm just yep. giddy that this is this is might be a way to eliminate HIV. Yeah, this sure, is there, 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 there are a couple of things that further down that are still are still interesting because they talked the first time they tried this they had a rebound. Um, some of that might be down to the delivery system, so yeah, you still have to be. I think they were working. Um, they were using um, this time an adeno associated virus to get into all body in all compartments of where the pockets of HIV form. So that, that may yeah. be part of the issue. So that needs to be tweaked and optimized. And um so yeah, so and Gendelman, the, sorry, Gendelman even notes that, right? He yeah, says absolutely that, yeah, so, single but, stereotype of viral vectors can only be given once to avoid a dangerous immune reaction. So I, I that that is definitely but still go on, John. Sorry. So the, the, basically really, the 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 the, the 
with with a lot of focus on delivery because there's a ton of focus on delivery. You know, we, we'll talk about that later. Um, and you know, we we're constantly talking to customers about about delivery systems, etc. Um, so with focus on that, you know, th- improvements are coming, and and they're saying possibly modified viral vectors might be the way to to go about this. So uh, it, yeah, it I just. To, it's it's still they're still saying it's early steps they're still learning but it's showing real potential and obviously the aim is to to get into the clinic to to take this further yeah excision biotherapeutics is gonna who's i think picking this up right is that what i'm reading and, and that's that's and who is one of the researchers who we didn't name so the two teams of the lewis Katz school of medicine at temple university and university of nebraska medical center um so it'd be um let's see prasanda dash uh, who's in the lab of Kamel Khalil of Temple, um, and and that's who. So, uh, Kamel Khalil is a co-founder of Excision Biotherapeutics. We're taking yeah. this forward. And Raphael Kaminsky and yep Chen Chen. So I'll give some shout outs and John. But this is it's still somewhat early, but this is coming like a freight train. Mm-hmm. I mean, CRISPR technologies are. Uh, actually, I think it leads nicely into our next topic, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, we I talk about things, um, you know, how quickly things move, and it's only when you you look back and you you um, you know you you you're you're talking to someone. I, I mean, obviously, I've been at lunch with colleagues today talking about LCMS, and I'm talking to people who who it, it's a new, a new technology to them. Yeah. And, and so you're talking about some of the history of it, and then you realize how far things have moved yeah. um, in, in a re- really relatively short time frame. And I was talking about LC, and I don't obviously I don't know the exact dates, but I'm thinking, you know, HPLC came on board, and it's probably like 50 years ago, but how quickly that has moved yeah. forward, and that's just a, a small part of our process. And yeah. you've got companies and scientists who are focused on every little piece of that and tweaking it further to make you know, obviously bioanalysis has moved incredibly quickly in the last um you know last yeah. 40 50 years and and this is true of you know um i'd say flow cytometry oh. jumped a whole bunch and so did pcr work to you know flows going from your standard uh into the spectral range of things that spectral flow jump they went from uh, sorry, this is a good sidebar here, John. They went from like 20 colors up to 40 and 60 now. Yeah. And then the sensitivity of PCR into DD PCR, where you're counting actual copy numbers, which we'll talk about more uh, with our guest. But yeah, yeah, no, you're right. And that and that and and um, short periods of time is 20 years, right, or whatever. That that's not a long. That's not a long it's, time. It's, it's really not at all. We'll see, for us, a key date was 1990, which is where you really saw commercial. Um, yeah commercial launch of electrospray sources and that's what opened LC because I was being asked well, what's LCMS applicable for what do you consider small versus large molecule I went I as I do went on down th- millions of tangents but ultimately it was electrospray source changed the the what LCMS thought was possible is where you you were thinking you you could I as long as you can ionize a molecule in the range of a mass spectrometer you can do it the electrospray source with multiple charging you can suddenly you can all of a sudden look at things that are hundreds of thousands of molecular weight you won't necessarily quantify them intact but you can still look at them and and that, but it all comes down to that one piece of that interface between the LC and the mass spec or really, yeah, that is all that source yeah john we have we have some people who helped helped engineer some of that uh, sure. maybe i think was involved well, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah we were all there in the early days i was never yeah. on the engineering side of things but obviously my previous career was at the lab with the uh, uh. jack kenyon who is the patent holder for the iron spray source that, that the reason why we do all our work at night when no one's in the lab is the iron spray source it was it, you know things built from that and it, it itself was a tweak of electrospray so yeah there's a lot of things going to John, we're never like, going to get through these I, I could, notes <laughs> in, sorry we're not going to be able to get through the news and notes no, no we, we are we're done. yeah our poor guest let's maybe we'll uh, Next we'll one, sorry, something in here <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all interesting sorry I it is no don't be sorry i think our audience doesn't is finding it interesting but i don't want to be uh i want to make sure we get uh, plenty yeah, of time and, and here the, yeah, this is this is one. Um, so I I think that's probably you're, you're going to more relate to this one, but still very very interesting. Um, Palion unveils phase one look at lawnmower and in inverted commas approach to glycoimmunology. Um, so it's like the the background to this, and this I'm I'm now I'm at, at the stage. Yeah, where I'm, I'm familiar I'm, with this stuff. This really is know what's stuff. going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Where it's basically 
Um, it's been known for a long time, 50, more than 50 years, that some patients' tumours have an abundance of sialoglycans that are complex carbohydrate chains attached to proteins and lipids, and those patients tend to do a lot worse. It was later discovered, I'm, going, I'm reading this because I don't know any of the background, that the upregulation of sialoglycans suppresses the immune system in more than 50% of cancer patients, according to Paleo and Pharmaceuticals, led by research, oh, sorry, led by research from Nobel laureate Carolyn Bertozzi's lab, the team at Palin is now working on a way to use glycans as a form of checkpoint therapy. Um, and they, they, they basically started publishing data. Um, so it, it's it's now, they, they, they're looking to, actually, I'll, I'll read it very quickly. Sialoglycans bind to inhibitory receptors called Cyglex, which play a role in helping cancer evade the immune system. And so Paleon is, Paleon is looking to cleave off that sialic acid and preventing it from forming, from binding with the Cyglex. And, and that becomes a route to then, you know, obviously uh, address the the, um, the the tumors, et cetera. I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, I mean, this um, Cyglex are uh, sialic acid binding immunoglobulin uh, type lectins. They're all part of the immune system. I, I kind of bucket them into um, surfactants and defensins. There's just that the innate immune system is uh, kind of understudied relative to adaptive immunity. And part of it is it's got so much redundancy. There's 14 different types of these Cyglex. And, but, um, you know, uh, I like that quote. Why didn't people think of this sooner? <laughs> yeah, sure. But really, it's just it's it just is right there, right? You, um, you just you just knock these these siglics down, and and the because it's suppressing the immune system. They're part of the they're part of you know a, a, the dual edged sword of the immune system, right, John? If it's if it's if you have hyperimmunity or you're immunosuppressed, you got to have that balance, and these help actually ablate the immune system, right? They help turn it off. Sure. Okay. And so. Yep. Um, you know, uh, it's when they say, why didn't people think of it sooner? Well, part of it is they still got to overcome maybe like, you know, inhibiting these things and then having some sort of effect somewhere. And I can't sure. tell if they've yep. gotten to that quite yet. Um, but it, and then the vastness of it becomes challenging. Well, uh, but oh, great stuff, too. I don't want to hate on it too much. I, I hope I don't sound like I'm hating on it. It's just there is um, when you start playing with innate immunity, it's uh, it's uh, got a, a much different uh shorter fuse so to speak and can be triggered much can have a uh it's just a harder thing to i don't know if manipulates the right word because it's not easy to do it to the adaptive immune system so yeah, but yeah. Um, i think i hope that made sense john but it's, it's <laughs> just a it is a it's a straightforward sort of like hey we know we've known for a long time chronic inflammation all these things these these this is part of the role in inflammation basically mm -hmm. yeah and they're targeting it yeah, I suppose the, the, what you can say is, and, and this is the, in the article from the phase one trial, they know they they, they have a dose de on the administration of their their therapy, they have a dose dependent desilation and then immune system activation. But you're right, then it's question: can can you control the immune system when this is happening? And yeah, and, but yeah, it's still and, uh, it could have major impact on just like a um, some sort of like they call it a checkpoint they use that kind of word in here somewhere i thought but it's not like a checkpoint inhibitor per se um like pdl1 for well maybe it does kind of fall into that sort of bucket where it might have great benefit if you're attacking from two two fronts so to speak using this type of um therapeutic which is say an adc for instance right you could have a sure. much broader potential synergies with it but good hats off to paleon you know this mm -hmm. is the but the world of um sialic acids and <laughs> they're they're tricky things a lot of people tried to um you know i know a little bit about ivig um if you know intravenous immunoglobulins and people tr they were uh, trying to the highly sialic acid labeled immunoglobulins were putatively more therapeutic so ivigs are always you know in that kind of great they're great for treating primary immune deficiencies but for instance in covid it was a a, a mixed result right mm -hmm. and so um that type of therapeutic if you could harvest just the sialic highly sialic labeled antibodies that is putatively a better therapeutic that kind of plays into what i think we're looking at here with these siglics these are just they're trying to get rid of them right um and and part of it is i think um 
th these are being popped off of that from are, are being are coming from that but you know it, it, it's coming from somewhere <laughs> right <laughs> uh, so anyway a, a little little uh side note on the one of the best things about immunology that i learned early on was you know i was looking at immuno oncology and people were looking at transplantation and when the two worlds collided there was a lot of like wait a minute that's not what we're doing because that's you're trying to turn the immune system on that way i'm trying to turn it off type yeah, of conversations yeah, yeah, and i yeah. think these siglics fall into the uh, the other side of the ivig world but that's my two cents john we, we can move on <laughs> sure yeah let's move on because this is a, this is a great i know that well we'll i mean this, this maybe, is, maybe this we just jump over this one just for the sake of time. We'll save this one. Let's get to the investments and then we'll wrap. Actually, up. I'd rather the, the investments won't take long. I think that's like a two minute thing. Yeah. We just basically, say it's coming. I think this is a really nice story because it's gene therapy. It's talking about you know where things are going. Um, I, I think it, so. This is let's let's go for it. Uh, it's okay. basically first for kind gene. I can I can move this quickly. First for kind gene therapy approved for healing wounds in butterfly children in inverted commas. And this is a this is a rare disease. Actually, it's a horrible disease. Cause I, I remember it, seeing it in the media years ago. Um, basically, uh, the, with the missing missing the, the actual condition is called dystrophic epidermis bullosa or DEB. Um, and it's what happens is they're missed the the patients uh, with it being a rare disease small population are missing a collagen protein that, that acts as a glue holding the inner and layer out inner and outer layers of skin together so basically they um they shed skin really easily if they cut it, it doesn't heal um so they i mean there's an awful lot of focus on uh, all they can do is just wrap themselves wrap them in bandages everything's painful you know they can't can't do anything without you know their their, their, their skin shearing etc so a really awful condition if you just sort of think about how it might affect the the children etc um so, so, so every, just everything, like this article says, is an act of torture. I mean, life is so painful. So this company, it's actually been just approved. Um, and this is gene therapy is de developed by a company called Crystal Biotech. It will be known as v Vajuvec. Um, and it's it's been approved for treating this condition. And it's, it's a gene therapy. But the interesting part of it is it, it's actually administered topically. Um, and the way it works is it, the the um, the virus that is they use an engineered virus to deliver genetic code for the collagen protein into the skin, and and what they found with patients or during um, in clinical trials is that when the wounds form, um, it actually does it it helps stopping them break, breaking back open. Um, so it actually helps those those wounds stay healed longer so they, they can do simple tasks again. Uh, actually, not even simple tasks, just simple basic functions. Um, one, they, they cite one um, patient. Uh, he was able to take a bath and sleep on his back for the first time without severe pain. So that's how much wow. difference it makes these people's life. That's why I wanted to touch on this. this yeah, yeah. Is it a protein? I'm not quite. Is, genet uh, is this a gene it's, therapy? It's or a gene something? therapy, yes. They don't yes. really tell me much about how or what the it, 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 is, I'll, I'll jump to that it's based on an engineered herpes simplex virus okay. which is used to deliver a gene that's much larger than the standard viruses used in other approved gene therapies can hold it's also the first gene therapy to apply to be applied topically to the skin rather than infused or injected and unlike other huh. gene therapies which are one and done treatments it needs to be done on a on a repeat basis so it's, it's sort of easy to eat well it's Easy to administer, but right now the right, FDA yeah. said we don't want you to administer it at home. We still want you to be doing a, a, a medical facility. So to some extent, there's still some um, there's some logistical issues for patients' lives. But in terms of the difference this could make to people's lives, it's absolutely huge. Yeah, um, and the real reason you want is because there's a former Rangers mid. I'm going. I, I wouldn't touch on that. It's, <laughs> it's a really interesting postscript to it all. And, and if you want, if you want to say a little bit, then no, I, 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 I don't. I don't much to add i, I think uh, i hope the audience understood this is uh using herpes viruses which we i haven't that seems to have probably uh, it's great to see that there's plenty of people researching it, and more importantly this is as you kind of indicated these are it's a collagen disorder and so uh they're very hard to treat um and uh for obvious reasons and as you indicated uh, if someone 
for the first time can sleep on their back, John. That this is like a miracle, right? I mean, yeah, so, yeah it's, it's, that's it's why miracle cures here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we we talk about proved medicines and, and things yeah. like this is as an, for for that small population, which is about three thousand people. It's an absolute life changer, and and from that perspective, it's you know I, I thought it was worth focusing on rather. It's like than, six thousand, they say, right? Uh, total. Oh yeah, six six, in, six US, in the US, six. Yeah, you're 3, right. You're right. In you're Europe, right. but I mean, I'm yeah. sure this this might you know okay, this is a Think about what, what could this technology do for psoriasis, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, why wouldn't sure. we look at that? But uh, why don't we wrap up and you so can vet, tell this warm the, story the, at the end the, here. Yeah, go ahead. So, and this was all coincidental. I mean, I saw about the crystal biotech drug being approved. And like I say, because it was one of those things you read about rare, rare diseases, this is going back years. I remember first reading about this butterfly skin condition and thinking, oh, my God, that must be awful. And yeah. it, it holds with you. And so that it was approved on the Friday, and then I think it was the Monday there was actually an appearance by um, Graham Souness, who used to play for Liverpool Rangers and in, in Scotland internationally. He was a midfielder, played soccer. Um, he was renowned as being a hard man on the pitch. You know, if you had to tackle with Graham Souness, you were lucky to still have legs. Um, <laughs> but it, it, so he was really known as a, his TV appearance had him appearing on TV with with a girl, uh, Isla Grist, who's fourteen year old, fourteen year old who's living with us at the moment, um, and he was like on he was at the edge of tears where he was talking about how fantastic she is dealing with this condition and how tough it is etc and the reason why he was on tv is he's announced that he and isla's dad and the team are going to be swimming the english channel which is about to england to france at this narrowest piece around 21 miles they'll they'll be swimming the swimming the english channel to raise money for treatment for this um this this condition so you can see then the two things come together so if they can raise your money they're there they have the ability to fund you know obviously yeah. treatment island maybe more for this treatment which is going to be expensive it's it's inevitable just because of the yeah. way it, it'll be expensive but it, it was just a really nice c- come together of two stories that were just i thought nice synergy there and yeah. yes that was, i thought it was a great well, way to, to sign off on the news it, um Sunes here sounds like Roy from uh, Ted Lasso, and I watched the season finale. I won't ruin that, but if you've watched Ted Lasso, he reminds me of Roy on that show. His, as you described him, someone that you're lucky to have legs when you finish. Yes. Nice. But um, you know, raising 1.1 million, uh, amazing, John. And then the 21 mile swim. Uh, I've seen some spe- documentaries on this swim. There's all you, you got to really be um, heavily. Um, Lubed. Yeah, as well as like your, you have to, you need a suit that because jellyfish bite you and all sorts of stuff can come at yep. you when you're. And yep. then uh, you know if you catch the wrong weather, a 21 mile swim might turn into like 50 because yeah. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> it can be kind of rough, right? You need a, you need a well dedicated team and yeah. and yeah, you need to know. Yeah, yeah it's, need, it's a it's a feat. It's uh, I I love swimming. Um, I think at one point it was on my bucket list, but I gotta tell you, unless uh. Unless someone can give me some really expensive bubble, they'll kind of float in. I'm not doing it, uh, but I would. I think it's fantastic, John. I, I, I would. Uh, man, I shouldn't say never. So, so um, I'm going to just say, find, just a couple of comments from Graham soon as to close this out, and then let's move on to the main topic. Um, so when he talked with B, with BBC Breakfast Show, he basically said, "Isla Grist is an inspiration, praise the courage." It properly punched me on the nose when I first witnessed the suffering. He said, "This disease is the cruelest, nastiest disease that I know of. For someone so young to be so brave, she's just an absolute hero." I think that's a really nice way to finish the news. And let's move on. Oh, we'll, yeah. we will. No, it's not quite finished the news. Let's move on. I, to the next yeah, one. I think we can quickly say this last one because yeah, I think absolutely. It's important. Yeah, blistering start to 2023 for the biotech, and that's music to our ears, John. Right there. Sure. So, so yeah. So in the last couple of years, obviously with COVID, we thought things were going to tail off. What we saw instead, with co- what we saw instead, was a boom in, in what was happening with yeah. um, IPOs and you know stock offerings, etc. And there was a lot of money being raised in the biotech industry. And then as tw- we got into 2022, we saw you know 
that that the IPOs really tailed off, investment tailed off, um, and then we've we've obviously been witnessing a lot of um, biotechs either downsizing or, or or really closing doors because they've they've run out of funds. So the next step, next sequence in this seems to be where we're seeing a lot of um, mergers and acquisitions, um, and it's not just big. There was always the speculation in during COVID with with companies like Pfizer that they were they were amassing large pots of money, so they were going to be buying a lot. But the, the mergers and acquisitions to, so far in 2023 haven't just been driven by large pharma. There's been a lot of small companies doing it too, partly to preserve or extend their, their runways for, for promising drugs. Um, and so as part of that, Fierce Biotech, which is one of the newsletters that, that I read for a lot of these these things we discuss, is actually started a mergers and acquisitions tracker for 2023. Um, and I, it, so it's, it's interesting just talking about, you know, what's happened so far and and what the big ones are and and yeah it's it's that that's 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 the story of 2023 for for biotech at least in the on the investment side of things yeah some of them are mega right like yeah absolutely pfizer's 43 billion for cgen i i bet you that ranks like third or fourth in the largest i feel like cell genes one and i think immunomedics was two and then maybe this one now uh seattle yeah, genetics massive yeah. you know merck Prometheus 10.8 billion, GSK for Bellis Health 2 billion. Yeah, that's that's a lot. And then you, as you mentioned, some of the other biotechs, and that, I don't know, John, that's it, it is uh, encouraging and um, great to read. Yep. So yeah, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it because obviously things that are you know have um, long term impact on where we think things are going we'll 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 discuss it but i i just thought it was worth worth mentioning yeah yeah no i i I, you know there's still you still read about layoffs here and there and i think there's some other uh still some covid um downsizing yet to come in in our space john and and, and certainly certainly it's it's happened in the the diagnostic side of things and and then in the manufacturing you're going to see as well those two areas you nailed it diagnostics because they ramped up to make all these tests and kits and everything, and now we're, you know, there's got to be a down to it. And I think hopefully companies that saw that understood that it was a, you know, you had light, lightning in a bottle, so to speak. And sure. the same Absolutely. thing with manufacturing, you know, you they swelled up all this CDMOs and so forth, and those those uh, groups are probably struggling to fill some of that just from a. It was such a massive buildup, right? It's I don't I don't think it's like the market's that bad. It's just you know, the, the world needed millions upon millions of vaccines that um, we still do, but it's the number's not nearly as, uh, the, sure. demand, the, the mandatory level is not as high. So with that, John, uh, exciting times in the biotech and pharma industry, but let, now we can move on to our main portion. And today, of course, uh, we have our very special guest, uh, Carrie Vidal of our uh, Associate Director of our Molecular and Cell and Gene Therapy. Um, Kerry, uh, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? And uh, hopefully I didn't hack your name up too badly. <laughs> not too badly. Of course, you know, I'm not sure I pronounce it correctly myself, um, given its ethnic background. It's been Americanized. Um, but I'm Kerry Villadal. Um, as Dominic mentioned, I'm Associate Director of Cell and Gene Therapy here at KCAS. I've been at KCAS about a year and a half now. Um And I came here to really work on building up our molecular service line and our offerings that we have, particularly in um, PCR-based assay development and uh, bioanalysis. Um, Before coming to KCAS, I had a pretty diverse background. My degree is in biochemistry, um, but I've worked in molecular biology, toxicology, pharmacology, with some focus on pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. So that's just a little bit about me. No, oh, great, Carrie. Um, and I feel like you've got a lot of pediatrics, but maybe I'm uh, <clears throat> mistaken there as well. No, I, you're, yeah. you're absolutely correct, Dominic. I uh, spent a number of years working at a local children's hospital um, doing pediatric clinical research in a variety of fields from oncology to um, different immune uh, disorders such as Crohn's disease and um, asthma. 
So I, I, I mentioned that because I think it's one of the hardest groups to treat from a bioanalytical perspective, right? The, but the collection of samples, the whole design of it has to be altered based off of the fact that mm -hmm. you just can't, it's hard to collect samples and want to do it routinely. But I digress a little bit there. <laughs> I think, but that, I think that's something that's just, as you mentioned, nice, rich, diverse background. We love it. Um, you know, Carrie, we're going to, we're going to jump right into um, the first thing is to, just to kick us off. Like, I think the question that comes to mind is just, just how big is cell and gene therapy specifically just cater to the molecular cell and gene therapy space. And so when I say how big, it's like, um, we just had JP Morgan, all of it was in that space, uh, specifically like Caspers and CAR T's and, uh, things like that. But, but I mean, from, from your seat on the bus, because I know where you participate in the community, AAPS, PCR group, how big does it feel like it's getting? We were, you know, and, and I've been at a couple of conferences, you were at some of them, but what, what do you, what, uh, what do you think about the whole molecular cell and gene therapy space? Oh my goodness. So you're right, Dominic, it's a huge field and what falls under the umbrella of what we call cell and gene therapy is constantly expanding. So um, whether it's, the cells that we are delivering for cell therapy and the types of cells and what modifications have been made to them, um, all the way to if you think about gene therapies, the types of molecules that we're delivering, you know, is it a DNA, an RNA, a, a small RNA, the modifications that are being made to them, uh, it, you know, it's constantly expanding. The sky's the limit, right? And I, you know, I'm amazed at what might be coming and what we haven't even dreamt up yet. Um, yeah. And, and I think for this being a bioanalytical show, um, really the, the, from my seat on the bus here, Carrie, you know, we're, we're, I think in, in a field that's emerging like this, the biggest demand is in, in my opinion, at this stage is in the PKPD space, right? How do we do that already? We can talk maybe a little bit about that. I think we'll, Maybe dot, we'll drill in a little bit more on the specifics of bioanalysis of that in a moment, right? Mm -hmm. But that's one demand. And then, you know, care we get asked a lot, and this is a this is the tricky one. It's that product characterization, I'm going to call it. And so that's an area where I think, as an organization, and you yourself, we're we're sitting there going, well, we can do all this stuff, but we just can't give you a GMP level or review. It's just not our space, right? So the regs are changing slightly. I think things are kind of leaning in our favor, but don't, don't, wouldn't you agree and maybe touch on like all of those tests there. And really, I think we have a lot of team members that know it. The regulations are opening up for us and, and isn't product characterization going to be some of the future of molecular testing in this space? You know, that's obviously going to be an important aspect of, of cell and gene therapy. You can disagree with me. That's part of the podcast. You can say, hey, wait a minute, Dom. That's all right. You, the, our audience would love someone to tell me I'm wrong. They are all rooting for you, Carrie. So I hear some hesitation there. Is is it just uh, you don't want to confuse people that we can't do a true potency? or? But I, I do think there are. Um, we're getting asked frequently to do test and maybe we need to transfer them to CDMOs, but I think the regs are going to fall in our favor. You know, I just don't know if it's going to go that way, Dominic, but okay. it, it could. It, 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 no, it no. And share why, why are you, is it more in line with just that's analytical and they're going to want people to adhere to that type of um, sort of testing or um, you don't see how, and maybe it's partly because I know in our dose formulation space, um, when we work with certain clients, we are a lot, we're, we're doing certificates of testing. Right. So that, that's where I'm going with that too. So, so you are aware of that. Okay. But you yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe you, look, you have a deeper perspective here than I do. So I'd love, this yeah. is fantastic. I love that you're like, Hey, I kind of agree with you, but wait a minute though. And I like that. That's okay. You know, <laughs> I think it comes down to a risk management, right? Yeah. yeah when, when you're going to put something into someone, you know, potential client's going to really weigh how important is it to us to have a the most information we can. Kristen, you know, information can be dangerous. Sometimes you don't want to know 
about, you know, you'll, 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 you'll learn something that, you know, something is there or you've got an effect that you didn't expect, but. And maybe that's my lack of understanding of like the potency tests themselves. Right. Um, because it's not my space. So I'm just, I'm just listening to, uh, some of our clients who have a stronger desire to do it in an analytical lab. And, um, and it's, it's more in a, um, uh, because a lot of times the manufacturing process is in a matrix and, or in a cell and these laboratories, <laughs> they don't focus on that. Like we do now they're improving. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say right. they can't do it, but I think your expertise lies in trying to find that, you know, molecular target in a cell, that molecular target right. in some sort of like biological matrix. So, but no, I, I think it's great, Carrie. You're you're tempering my expectation, and what, like I said, I, I think those that uh, do listen to it are probably like good for Carrie. So, um, <laughs> but um, maybe a little bit more on what are some of the other uh, therapeutics that um, are hot, you know. Uh, things that you see as part of the 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 why why there's so much buzz in the cell and gene therapy space. Talk to us a little bit about the emerging technologies or those that are out there and your thoughts on, you know, how, you know how you see some of that um, playing out uh, in terms of, you know, not so much market but bioanalytically and where even KCS efforts are going to go. So, you know, ever since its discovery, the CRISPR-Cas9 system has, you know, really, you know, been, been a source of a lot of speculation of what it's going to allow us to do. And I think we're really on the cusp of starting to realize some of that promise, right? Um, so with CRISPR, we can do in vivo gene therapy. So we can introduce this system into a patient. We can edit their genome, essentially curing a genetic disease for them. Um, and so, you know, again, this, this technology has held a lot of promise and, and, and I think we're really getting close. Over the next few years, I think we're gonna really start seeing this coming into to human trials, um, and that that's really exciting to me. Yeah, amen. And how about things like um, so? So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can support some of that, but in general, uh, other adaptive cell therapies, right? Oh um, yes, stem cells. It's it, mesenchymal, right? Autologous versus allogenic. All of that carry right, and and that's those are the even even in today's news and notes, some people are still using like you know, herpes, right? That kind of, uh, what did you, that, that caught me off guard, right? Every AAVs and mRNAs and siRNAs, right? Just the, the sky's the limit, right? All of those fall into services that we can help support, right? Oh yeah. And, and, and like you mentioned, the, the car cell therapies, I mean, we're constantly making strides, um, in that field. Um, you know, originally they were very much, you know, one therapy, one patient sort of thing. And, you know, we're moving towards this off the shelf mm. car therapies, but, um, you know, are really going to accelerate how fast we can treat patients. Um, and then you've got the delivery methods, the developments that you, that are going on there. Um, you know, you mentioned that HSV, um, AAVs, you know, traditionally being used, but the, the developments that are occurring there with the engineered AAVs that can improve um, delivery so we can get more targeted delivery of our gene therapy, um, as well as improving the, the, the amount of gene therapy that gets in there, the robustness of the response. Um, and then there's even the non-viral vectors and the developments that are going on there with um, like your, your lipid nanoparticles, your LNPs. So, so there's really a lot of ways to look at um, all of the developments that are coming down with cell and gene therapy, whether it's the therapy themselves, you know, the CRISPRs, um, uh, gene delivery, car therapies, um, or the delivery methods. So yeah. viral vectors, non-viral vectors, you know, so there's just 
and they're all converging, right? Yeah, no, uh, exactly. And I think that's a nice segue into how do we like the services we offer or in general, the bioanalysis that's needed for these is, in my opinion, still emerging and somewhat in flex. But there's some key, um, let's call them PKPD markers. Um, and, and really, it's um, to me, it's that on target, off target testing. And maybe you can share your because that's the bulk of I believe where your QPCR uh, testing needs to be performed. And obviously non-clinical has a whole new sort of set of um, regulatory uh, guidelines and even that's loose, right? So it's like opinions, let's call them that. And then in the clinical space, there's probably more clearer um, uh, because you're limited by the number of matrices you can get from a human trial. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, so that's a little easier. Um, and, and to me, it's it's all in that bio distribution type of um, um, studies. And so maybe and some, sometimes we forget, Carrie, how much we know we're drilling way down. But maybe we just just take a because some of our audience might not be that familiar with this stuff. So maybe you can just we'll just pull it back a little and just talk about what I maybe go over a little bit about on target, off target, how we measure it. Some of the regular, you know, you don't want to validate all of them. Just share your thoughts around some of that. And let's start with um, non-clinical, and then you can go into a clinical. Sound good to you? Sure. So, and and you know, Dominic, I, you know, don't, you know, I'm I've got to focus on PCR-based um, bioanalysis and assays to support cell and gene therapy. Um, as you're aware, well, as you are well aware, KCAS can support cell and gene therapies in many other ways, right? Whether it's ADAs or, um, you know, our LB. Oh yeah. No, all the so, entire immunogenicity portion of it is exactly. not germane to you. Yes. We yeah. have, we have probably three ways to support three major or maybe five really, but the, um, we have our immunogenicity and that can be both antibody based as well as cellular based, right? right. Uh, we can do so meaning humoral or adaptive immune responses. We have, um, I'm going to call it biodistribution PK and, even biomarkers, but biomarkers sure. in the PCR yep. space and biomarkers across all of our platforms. And then um, even in like the LNP space, we use a lot of mass spec, uh, siRNAs, things of that nature could be done by both ligand binding and PK. So yeah, I mean, you, we can we can make it very narrow for you, Carrie. It's more <laughs> that biodistribution stuff, <laughs> which can be done by LCMS, but in a, in a cellular space, it's typically done by PCR. Um, right. So maybe we'll just focus on that. Yeah. I mean, that that's, you know, I don't want to, you know, be so focused on PCR on, on such a broad question without sort of caveating it. <laughs> that This is my bias. This is my wheelhouse. Um, so, but, you know, just a little bit about um, the molecular services that we offer here at KCAS. So we have a team of, of eight, we have four PIs and four analysts, and we have a, you know, while while this is a new, a relatively new offering at KCAS, we have assembled a team with lots of experience in developing and performing qPCR and DDPCR assays. Um, and so uh, here at KCAS, we can do both qPCR as well as droplet digital PCR. Um, all the way from assay design, method development, method qualification, validation to um, bioanalysis, and we can do this in, a, you know, a wide variety of matrices. Um, just my background alone, um, I've got sample prep experience in, oh my goodness, dozens of tissues. Um, from multiple species. So, you know, we've got you covered both preclinically as well as clinically. Um, I think I've kind of diverged off topic here. No, no, you, you're good. I think that's, uh, you're, you're, you're fine. Uh, that's part of, um, certainly part of our agenda was to go over what we do. And maybe along that vein, you can just talk more about the services that we do offer if you, if you sure. want to elaborate a little more. So, um, you know, as with any therapeutic um, you know, we're concerned with about exposure and response, right? So the pharmacokinetic aspects of it, 
and the pharmacodynamic um, outcomes. So in that aspect, it's not too different. And so how we can use PCR-based assays to do that is um, we can look at the drug itself. So what's being delivered if it's, um, say, a gene that's being delivered in an AAV or an LLP, LNP, we can actually measure that cargo um, and its distribution throughout the body, um, particularly in preclinical studies um, where we have access to more tissues. Um, and then we can also look at the expression of that therapy or the effects of that therapy. Let's say it's an siRNA and the effect is to knock down um, an endogenous gene. And we can look at that in the target organs and we can look at that in um, off target organs. Um, so we've got your biodistribution assays that we can perform. We can look at vector shedding um, in, in um, both preclinically and clinically. Um, as, as I mentioned, the DNA and RNA uh, PD biomarkers. Um, and <clears throat> even further upstream, we can look at um, copy number variation. So um, how much of the gene therapy is being delivered um, and how long does it persist in the body or in the cell that it's targeting? Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of an overview. I'm sure I'm forgetting. No, I think that was uh, really a good uh, broad, you know, again, the biomarkers, but you don't have to drill into that. We can do any sort of biomarker work from that. But uh, no, I think your your description of things is good, especially the viral count piece and, uh, you know, the obviously biodistribution. So with that, Carrie, I think it's uh, we can we can move into our next uh, topic here, which is, okay. um, you know, I, where, where I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, we're part of the AAPS uh, uh, PCR subgroup. Uh, you are very active. I'm sort of in the periphery, <laughs> right? I'm I'm worried about my critical reagents group a little more these days. Shameless plug for critical reagents. No, um, so, so what? And, and this is something that I feel like you and I have talked a little bit about. Uh, certainly, I'm. Um, having more of the CLIA background uh, myself, having worked in a CLIA lab that did PCR reactions and understand some of their practices. And it's really something that's clashing with the GLP space a little bit. At best, I use that term. I, uh, it's not that bad. I just, it's, it's about as big as a debate as you're going to see in open forums and it's, it's fun. Um, but, you know, talking, what's the hottest thing? It's replicates, right? So maybe just drill into like, that's such a big term. You can take it wherever you like. But what, when we say replicates in a PCR space or even a DD PCR space, because that's, that, that is where replicates to me incorporates the calibrators and calibrators consist of standards and QCs and then replicates in general are of my, my samples, right? So share with us, when we say replicates, that's, that's, I'm talking about those items, calibrators and my actual samples. Yeah. So, um, you know, this was a recent discussion, um, in one of these subgroup meetings. Um, and actually this was, um, the, the EBF PCR or cell and gene therapy working group that I've recently started participating with. Um, you know, what, what constitutes a replicate? Um, so often, with PCR, we think about the technical replicates, you know, how many wells are we doing on the plate? And, you know, there's different recommendations, even though they're both PCR assays. With qPCR, you know, generally people feel good about, we need to do three replicates. replicates. Whereas with DDPCR, you know, we can do one or two technical replicates, which is just, you know, seems crazy, right? Um, but, you know, other people are saying, yeah, we only need one technical replicate. That's all we need. Um, but then from a bigger perspective, if you think about it, you know, is a replicate really a replicate sample from your tissue or your matrix of interest? Um, and then so how many replicates is appropriate? Um, what are the sampling errors associated with those replicates? And I think, you know, as 
an industry, we're still kind of grappling with that. Um, and everybody takes a different approach to it. And I think part of the reason we take a different approach to that is we've been in a situation where we've gotten burned. <laughs> So is that down? And I'm I'm talking out of complete ignorance here. I'm obviously you can tell I've been quiet all all, all discussion because it's it's totally outside my my ken. Is that because of like the heterogeneity within tissues? Um, so you do, if you sample from one spot, you're not representing the tissue, or or what's that? What's that down to? Well, sure, because you know we know that every tissue in the body is not just sure. a homogenous, you know, one homogenous cell type in that tissue. Um, so thinking about where your cell or gene therapy is going in that organ, depending on where you've sampled, yeah, you know, that bulk sample is gonna, could, could potentially be made up of different proportions of cell types. True. Um, you know, so how many replicates do you need to, um, to have a confident, number. Uh, and, and then, you know, when you're looking at a human, um, population, it's just, you know, the, the variability and the heterogeneity that there is in humans. I mean, we're not, we're not inbred mice, so we have different genetic backgrounds. We have different diets. We live in different places. So, you know, understanding what, what that heterogeneity is doing to our interpretation of the data sure. um, is kind of a big deal. Just grind <laughs> the whole thing up then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, you, I, you know, Carrie, this is the, the, what you're talking about. There is even more uh, drilling down than what I was thinking about in terms of replicates. Cause you're absolutely right. If I just take a small piece of this organ, what does that really mean? And even so sure. it gets, it gets even harder to normalize that, right, Carrie? Now, there's another term <laughs> that has been, we get asked all the time about that one, right? Like, how do we normalize? And that gets into what I think some of the topic was. But, I, um, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we can go from le replicates to, you know, when we talk, you know, the next kind of topic on our agenda is uh, what are the pitfalls for GLP? And I think I just touched on one, right? Like, how do you normalize this stuff? And, you know, I think there, it depends, you know, and you and I can be using the same words, but we're thinking about it in different terms. So if you're talking about a cell therapy and a biodistribution assay, normalization looks different than if I'm looking at a pharmacodynamic biomarker to look at response of a cell gene therapy. I mean, that's, those are I would say that you, you would take different approaches to what normalization means there. And then you have this whole other camp that's like, meh, you don't even need to do that. There, you know, you don't need to normalize if you just put in a constant amount of template material. That's that's all the normalization you need. Now I I don't know if I'm there yet. Yeah, I don't even understand that. But I mean I do and I don't, but that there's the Clear aspect of things that makes the GLP world, or what? Who's who feels like you don't, or maybe it's pharma. I'm, where is that coming from? Where it's just like, hey, we shouldn't, we don't really, and and you know, there is. I feel like it's something you need to do a feasibility study on. But maybe I'm just too narrow minded in terms of trying to, because there may be times where you don't need to normalize it. I'm not saying you don't need to, but I think you got to check it. And I think you're right. Um, I think though too with normalization, you have to you have to pick the right thing to normalize by. Um, and and why it, not just a, a housekeeping gene of some sort, like a, a beta actin or whatever, right? Isn't that a common one? Or what are some of the common genes that could be potentially used? So that's going to vary by matrix, right? Um, yeah, you know, gap DH, beta actin. Gap DH, yeah, sorry, that's a big one. You know, those are sort of these reference genes that people have used for years um, saying, oh, you know, they're expressed ubiquitously and they don't change, right? 
that's a bit naive. Yeah, it, it, because of the sensitivity of the platform. So it, when you admit, yeah, you're you're right, and and so um, when we say how, maybe um, it, when take a small when I say normalize, do they use that actual data bit to generate the targeted PD or PK marker? Is there like in my mind, like the BCA assay, for instance, in tissues, is part of the calculation of the um, you know mig per you know nanogram per gram of of material, right? So it's still the same type of calculation. Do I have that right, Carrie, in the PCR world? So the approach we usually take in the PCR world is you'll you'll measure, say, your target biomarker of interest and you'll get a value. And then in that same sample, and oftentimes even in the same PCR reaction well, you will measure this normalizer or reference gene. Um, and then you'll simply take a ratio of okay, those good. two yeah. values. Yep, but I, that, that's how I had done it years ago, and I'm just yeah. making sure that's what you're doing in the lab now. I guess it's an obvious answer, but I'm makes me feel a little more comfortable around because you said something very powerful earlier. It's like the terminology people are using in the setting is where we're getting a lot of confusion because I might be talking about normalizing for a biodistribution study, just like you said. And then you might be thinking about it from a, Hey, what's this pharmacodynamic mechanism of action type of marker that I'm looking at. Um, right. And that, and that becomes very different uh, strategies to, to measure it bioanalytically. So that's, I think that's an important uh, kind of, uh, when we're talking about hot topics, I think it starts with some nomenclature. That's the first thing. Make sure you're um, identifying the terms that you're using, Carrie, right? That's a careful thing. And then um, even better yet, I feel like uh, you, you have to have, your mind has to switch between is this a bio distribution? Is it a viral count? Is it a biomarker? And, and then even from there, you, you, your whole design changes slightly. I, th I think that's probably where the field is today, right? It's not. It's not a overall like. In in we have the uh, benefit of like fifty years of mass spec GLP or I don't know forty or whatever it might be, and like thirty in the LBA space to have these regulatory guidelines that can help. Um, you know, kind of bucket everything. I, I just don't see that in the PCR world. And I don't think that's something that's going to pop up within the next year because there's just so much disagreement on the terminology and even the the way we go about uh, uh, measuring these things, even within those buckets. So I'll let you maybe comment on that. Well, and I think it's also, you know, again, we, we kind of bucket qPCR together with uh, digital PCR. Uh, but, you know, I think we're going to find that the recommendations are going to be a little bit different between those two platforms, even though. And, and so you say a little bit different, but in the, in the GLP world, there's no such thing. If they're different, they need to be different. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I think, and I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, another topic that we kind of keep circling back around is, limits of detection, limits of quantification, and, and limits of blank, and and what these terms mean um, for DDPCR versus qPCR. Let's um, drill in a little bit there. Unpack what you just said. What is the difference between the lower limits of, say, quantitation between PCR and qPCR? Yeah. So with quantitation, limits of quantitation, that's, and, and even limits of detection, you know, um, what can we reliably quantify over and over again, um, and what can we reliably detect over and over again? Um, where things get a little squishier is around limits of blank. Um, with qPCR, if I run enough PCR cycles, I could pretty much get every sample to turn positive. Wow! Is that is that is that a real signal though? Um, that's John, no. John Perkins. What do you think about what you just said there? Why don't you, don't you imagine if you could just run the machine enough that you'd get what you needed? <laughs> does it work um, yeah. that way, John? Is that does that surprise you as somebody who's not as? I mean, well, it doesn't surprise me at all. I knew that. Well, well, I'm guessing, well, were you aware of that? 
based based on no, I've never even thought about it. I've never even heard the term limits of blank before. But based on how the um, how it, how the function is done in terms of you know increasing increase, increasing the count with time, yeah, I suppose I'm not surprised that you could you could amplify a, a background to give you a, a, a spurious reading or spurious positive. Um, but I never really thought about it before, you know. Um, yeah, but just yeah. the fact that you could just sit there and anneal, right? You know the principles of PCR. If you just keep going, eventually it's going to come to something. I think that's like, anyhow, Carrie, I, I took a side turn on you there. But that that is, <laughs> I don't know how much, how many people were aware of that fact, right? It just seems like, um, well, anyhow. It, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, had a, I had a supervisor who will remain nameless at one of my stop-offs in my career who, if you gave him mass spec data, could massage it to the extent that he could imagine anything into being. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, you're right, John. Bad people do bad things, I guess, right? Like, you know. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not accused of being bad. He just, I mean, it was at a time when we, you know, it was trying to see what he could detect on what was the sensitive instrument and what was the signal real and, and we were down in the grass and some of us would say yeah I'm, I'm I, we're low enough in the grass that I'm not going to count that whereas he would be tweet 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 can we get something you know but yeah that it was it wasn't dishonest what he was doing no no I didn't, was, yeah, well I think I think sometimes people believe it, yeah or, or they overinterpret it's a genuine yeah. yes but exactly. uh, I think if it's habitual behavior that's when I start to wonder about it but that's okay I digress um so Back on topic here, Kerry. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the pitfalls. Maybe we'll just dive right into uh, some of what you're up to. Why don't you tell us about this uh, EBF uh, um, or uh, what, what you're what you're uh, going to be doing and presenting in the coming weeks here? So next week, actually, I am headed to Malaga, Spain where I will be attending um, the EBF Spring Focus Workshop on oligonucleotides and peptides. Um, I've been invited to give a talk there um, surrounding some of the, the work we've done um, using PCR to detect and quantify DNA aptamers in plasma. So... DNA aptamers are sometimes called chemical antibodies. So they, this is kind of a little, it, while, it's, while it's a DNA sequence, it doesn't function the way we kind of normally think of as a gene therapy, but it, it's kind of fallen into that category. But these short pieces of DNA, or they can also be RNA, um, fold up and have um, a tertiary structure that can actually bind to a target of interest, whether it's a protein or small molecule. Um, so they're sometimes called chemical antibodies. Um, part of the excitement behind these aptamers is, you know, they function like antibodies. They can neutralize a target. They can activate a target um, or they, or that we can just use them to detect um, a target of interest in a matrix. Um, but one of the things that's really exciting about them is that unlike antibodies, it kind of takes some time to develop and produce and characterize. These aptamers, we can synthesize very quickly. Um, if we've got one that doesn't work, we can quickly move on to the next one. Um, oftentimes they use selects to... Um, you know, screen a whole bunch of these at once, find the, the, the sequences that appear to have the function of interest, um, and then we can start to characterize that. But one of the hurdles with these aptamers is how do we detect and quantify them, particularly in a biodistribution um, type setting. So understanding what the exposure is um, and, and the elimination of these aptamers from the body. Um, so we developed um, a PCR-based um, assay to uh, quantify, to detect, to detect and quantify these aptamers. These aptamers tend to be short, where they're anywhere from 40 to uh, 80 nucleotides long. And anybody who's done PCR 
um, you know, we need primers in the reaction. And those primers themselves are usually at the shortest they are, are about 20 nucleotides long. So when you have a target that's only 40 nucleotides long, um, you have to be a little creative in how you can design primers that will target something that's almost the same size as the primer itself um, and how to get amplification. <clears throat> so our approach though was to design primers with adapters on the ends to help us make a longer uh, PCR product. And this helps us with then detecting the fluorescent signal that's produced as we amplify these targets uh, through the PCR reaction. Um, so in this initial feasibility study, we tried to amplify aptamers that were either 39 base pairs long up to about 65 base pairs long. Um, and we were successful and were able to um, do this amplification um, just by qPCR using a double-stranded DNA binding dye for our uh, detection chemistry. Yeah, aptamers of uh, strange little entities, in my opinion. And you're right; they can be manufactured quickly. And uh, you know, what uh, your ability to measure them, if I recall, at that level was somewhat—I don't know if "novel" is the right word—but you unlocked some areas where there was some troubles for, for that particular client. Is that, is that right? I don't know the details around that. Well, you know, a lot of, so, so there's you know, been a couple of aptamer therapeutic, thera therapeutics that have, that are in or have gone through uh, clinical trials. Okay. And so some of the detection methods, um, you know, of course we could do LCMS on them or um, there are some PCR-based methods, but they rely on a ligation step that can be very inefficient. Um, yeah, and, and, and if you're talking um, those 40 to 80 um, nucleotides, we're, we're not, that's not where mass spec is really going to function that well. I mean, uh, talking to the internal team, um, they're saying their upper limit is around, I'm trying to think, is around the, the 10,000 molecular weights is around 35 yeah and beyond that it gets really tough um and, and and i would say for pcr our our lower limits probably that 40 nucleotide mm -hmm. length so you know we're just kind of buttoned up each other yeah, against exactly. each other there <laughs> and if i could step in here i mean that this this uh, the timing of this like the nucleotide workshop is great because this it, is a really a really hot hot topic oligonucleotides are a hot topic at the moment um we i think every customer visit i've been involved in recently people have brought up what's your oligonucleotide experience and and certainly you know we've got lcms experience but the, the smaller end of things i will also be attending this workshop in malaga but for that reason because i want to see what other people are doing out there is there anything that we can learn from we obviously have built up a good amount of experience ourselves but it's also going to be good to to be to hear what others are doing and then um coincidentally another reason why i'm over in europe is i'm talking a like a nucleotide and peptide meeting in milan um and it's the i think it's the international like nucleotide and peptide congress in milan and there's mainly european attendees and it's mainly um it's not a bioanalytical focus it's much more uh, people who are working with the ligand nucleotides so again it'll be interesting to hear what people are doing and hopefully see what you know if people see what we can do then maybe something that we can help them with when when they're in the bioanalysis bio um, piece of, of of developing their their drugs. So yeah, like it's a like I say, legos are hot at the moment. It's a, just a nice segue from what we've been talking about and and how this is you know, where where it's the small part of of obviously what you you're mainly focusing on, but it's um you know a, a big deal. Yep, popping the oligo onto a a, a biologic is. Uh, quite the rage too right there's been a sure. lot of movement yeah. there um and those discussion there definitely uh, so, yeah so carrie uh we're we're um we're wrapping up here uh really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us here on our lovely podcast um do you have any parting thoughts for the uh for our audience around just uh 
in general, the cell and gene therapy space, the molecular service space, or the bioanalysis space. Any parting words before we put you on the hot seat? I hope you're ready <laughs> for the hot seat. Um, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm so excited um, to see where this field takes us over the next five, 10 years. Um, you know, this, you know, I, I think we toss it around, you know, transforming lives, but, you know, I think this really has the potential to truly positively affect um, just pretty much everyone. Yeah. Um, eventually. I think all of us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. I, I, I agree. It's, it is something that's um, really, you know, the, uh, every, I think I've said this before on the podcast, every day we're getting closer to curing diseases than the previous mm -hmm. day. And part of it's right in this space. Exactly. It's a combination. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's key. It's we're going to be curing diseases and not just treating yeah. them. That's a big one, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, when you start, you start augmenting T cells, augmenting, you know, genes, you are not treating the symptoms because historically we've just been treating the symptoms, right? Knocking down inflammation or knocking down, a, you know, whatever sort of maybe tumor antigens and factors and trying to ablate, you know, surgically remove and irradiate enzyme replacements through proteins. We're talking about one shot injections or, you know, there was a topical one today, but treatments that truly are engineered to, to treat it, not just treat the symptoms. Right. Sure. That, that's Absolutely. powerful. Yep. 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 All right, Carrie, first one for you. What's your favorite dish to make? Lay it on us. Oof. So, um, I'm a baker. Okay. Um, so probably my favorite thing to do, and I don't do it often enough, is I will bake kolaches. Ooh. <clears throat> Never made a kolache. John, you got any? They, I like eating them. I got, <laughs> you know, I got a Polish wife and a Polish Czech oh, wife. Do I, I yeah, don't know ahead. what kolaches are. Really? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, they're sort of like a Danish, but instead of like a sweet bread, it's it's a... It's not as a sweet dough. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So it's a little more savory, but then it's still got that sweet filling to it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, kolaches can be served with uh, fruit fillings. They can be served with bacon and eggs, right? So do you have a favorite kolache you like to make? Because they they tend to be, a to me, they seem to be a morning or breakfast food, but do, do, or do you make them for dessert? <laughs> In my family, they're in any time of day. Yeah, I got that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, normally I do um, the fruit filled ones. Now, again, um, I learned how to bake these uh, from my husband's grandmother. It's her oh. recipe. Um, and so what you're talking about, those, they're almost like a dumpling with eggs. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she called them something completely yeah, different. Yeah, I think so it is. That, to her, that is not a kolache. Oh, let me be clear. I'm talking about the kolache factory. It's shocking that John, John, it's funny. We have a place called, a couple of them out here called the kolache factory. And they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, kind of a, a place to get take out or, you know, kind of like a pizzeria for kolaches. So you can go in and get <laughs> breakfast ones and, um, danishes and things like that. So I had to, I had to throw my pizzeria. I want to learn more about that recipe. Tell so how far back does this go? I think that's great. You got grandma's recipe. Oh gosh. Um, maybe just guesstimates for us. Like what, what are we talking about? You know, it's at least great grandma's recipe. I, you know, how far it goes back beyond that. I, I don't know. I don't know. So I've, I've got a story. I've got a quick story on the, on the old family recipe front um my daughter is getting married in september which i've mentioned before and um my my father's grandmother had a recipe book that when we went through his belongings we found and my elder sister copied pages etc um and i was a couple of pages that i couldn't read so i asked for a fresh copy of them it turns out one of the recipes is for a wedding cake so um we are currently testing or tweaking to basically to we're going to use my grandmother's recipe to provide a wedding cake for my for my daughter's wedding so we had the first test this last weekend and it it was okay it taste was good it was yeah it needed work but i think we know the right path to go on but yeah that's um that's at least one of the tiers will be um her great grandmother's recipe within the wedding Okay, that's so Gary, cool. you're in luck. Uh, we're we're running short of some time okay. here, yeah. so we're gonna take you off the hot seat, 
and uh, we're going to let you, uh, we're going to let you, well, maybe just quickly tell me your favorite drink. Uh, you know, probably a gin and tonic. Oh, very nice. You got a favorite gin. Um, you know, lately I've been drinking a lot of Hendrix. Ah, try Uncle so Val's. You ever hear Uncle Val's? I have not. Oh, I will. look up that one. You'll like Uncle Val's. And if Linda, you, go ahead. If you want an opinion on gin, try Chase Dry, which is just, I think you can get it in the U.S. Um, Chase is from Herefordshire, and it's about, the distillery is about two miles as the crow flies from where my father grew up. Um, but their, nice. their gins and vodkas are excellent. I'm going to have and, to look um, that one up. But they, uh... they, they've, they've just been bought out by, I think it was Diageo, one of the, one of the bigger concerns. Mm. So, I mean, if I remember, I'll try and bring some over. Uncle to Val's, you should be able to find everywhere, Carrie. It's, it should be anywhere in Johnson County. You can get that. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> and look, it's got like, you'll see it now. It's got like a green label and, uh, you know, guy with a pair of glasses on it. And they come in a couple different varieties. I like the traditional green labeled one, but they got like a botanical one and a Hmm. lavender or something but they're all good they're all delicious and uh with that you know um we we're gonna we're gonna quickly uh drop off here even though i've been cooking all sorts of wonderful foods john but we're gonna have to shelve that i did get my pizza reference in um you know everybody have a have a good one here and uh Really enjoyed. I want to say thank you to Kerry and John. Maybe you can give us some parting thoughts before. Yes, yeah, th thanks very much, Kerry. I, I, we, we, I've, I've learned a lot today because obviously you're talking about uh, a part of the field that I have very little contact with. So it's always always good to listen more to that. And um, yeah, in terms of the food stuff, I'm sure I have plenty of dishes to talk about once I'm back from Europe. But um, yes, let's 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 close up. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.